All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A researcher wants to learn if the color of an object affects how often someone will choose that object. The researcher lines up five objects of different colors and has the first participant choose any object. The remaining unchosen objects are then taken away and objects with different colors are added to the array. What does this resemble? Pretty straightforward preference assessment question to begin. Let's trust our preparation, take advantage of the easy question, answer it, and move on. So if we have five objects of different colors, right? Five objects, and the participant is told to choose an object. And let's say this object is chosen, the triangle. We put the triangle back and then we, we replace the other objects. What are we using? Well, we know it's not a forced choice because that involves two stimuli. And here we have a total of five. So it can't be a forced choice. It's also not a free operant because a free operant has to do with a child-led strategy where we're just observing. And this is very contrived. So this must be multiple stimulus. And since we are replacing some stimuli, it has to be a multiple stimulus with replacement. As you get more fluent and better at the exam, you're going to be able to go through that mental process very rapidly. And a question like this is going to be very easy to answer. You are ready for your post-lunch coffee. When you go to prepare the coffee, you notice you have no coffee filters. You weren't planning on leaving the house to go to the store, but now you get in your car and head to Target to buy filters and a couple of other things. What is the motivating operation relative to going to the store? So we have a motivating operation question. What does a motivating operation do? It alters the value of a consequence, and it temporarily either evokes or abates behavior. It's going to alter and temporarily change behavior. Now, in this case, right, you want coffee, but you have no filters. So now you're going to the store, and that's what we're talking about. We're going to the store. Could you have gone to the store at any time? Yes, but the only reason there was motivation was what? Well, you had no coffee filters. So only once you found out or realized you had no coffee filters, did you go to the store? So what was the motivating operation relative to the store? A, your post-lunch coffee. Well, you have your post-lunch coffee, but if you had filters, you would have never gone to the store. So the coffee did not change the value and it did not evoke the temporary behavior of going to the store. What happened was you had no coffee filters. And so now there's much more as a reinforcing consequence for heading to the store and getting filters. C, needing other items. You went to the store and then you bought other items, but that wasn't the reason you went in the first place. It was the lack of coffee filters. And then D, the availability of Target. Target was always there. You could have gone to Target at any point regardless, but the only reason you did, the reason the value of going to Target changed, the reason that behavior was temporarily evoked was you had no coffee filters. So the MO, relative to going to the store was no coffee filters. A clinician is working with a client who initially required a continuous schedule of reinforcement. As the client becomes more proficient, the clinician gradually shifts to reinforcing the client only after every fifth task, then eventually to reinforcing only at the end of the session if a specified number of tasks are completed correctly. Despite the reduced frequency of reinforcement, the client's performance remains consistent. Which of the following is the primary goal of this fading process? When we think about fading, we are typically fading prompts or reinforcement schedules. We're always fading these stimuli. And in this case, what are we fading? We're fading reinforcement, right? We start with an FR1, a continuous schedule. As the client gets better, we're now on an FR5. So we've faded it, we've thinned the schedule. And then eventually, only at the end of the session, if there's a specified number of tasks. So we've really thinned out the schedule. Continuous is every time to a situation where you've got to wait to the end of session to get reinforcement. So it's, it's a very aggressive fading process. 
But despite that, the client remains consistent. Why? What is the goal of the fading process? What is, what is the goal of fading out reinforcement in this manner? A, reduce the client's dependency on reinforcement and increase intrinsic motivation. Be very careful here, right? Even though we're not providing the reinforcement, the environment, or we hope the environment of the task is still reinforcing the client. And that's the goal here, right? When we're fading reinforcement, contrived, socially mediated reinforcement, we're not removing the need for reinforcement. We're just hoping reinforcement occurs more naturally. And then the idea of intrinsic motivation really starts to encroach on non-behavior analytic ideas. So be careful with A. B, eliminate the need for reinforcement altogether for the target behavior. Our behavior is context reinforcement in the natural environment all the time. We're never going to eliminate the need for reinforcement altogether. C, decrease the response effort required for the client while decreasing available reinforcement. Well, we're not decreasing the response effort, right? Because we go from an FR1 where every response is reinforced to an FR5 where you have to engage in the response five times. The response effort has increased in that particular scenario. And then D, shift control of the behavior from contrived reinforcement to naturally occurring contingencies. Yeah, that's the main idea, fading reinforcement. We want to go from this contrived reinforcement, lots of reinforcement, to much more naturally and environmentally occurring contingencies. Luna used to take breaks at work that exceeded her all allotted break time. After several interventions, including extinction, Luna stopped taking extra long breaks. Three months later, Luna took an unexpected extra long break, which caused her boss to become very upset. What would you, a behavior analyst, attribute the cause of the break to initially? Straightforward extinction question, right? We're talking about the cause of the break. What break? Well, Luna took this unexpected long break after three months. Three months after what? Extinction. So if we have a situation where we have a behavior, Luna's taking these breaks, we put the behavior on extinction, we go through an extinction burst, the behavior then starts to decrease, we, we end extinction, but then all of a sudden, even though the behavior decreased and it's down here, it pops back up. What do we call this? That sudden emergence of that behavior after extinction. A, resurgence, B, spontaneous recovery. What's the difference? Resurgence has to do with teaching a replacement and the replacement no longer receiving reinforcement. We didn't discuss replacement behaviors here. What we're focused on here is this idea of spontaneous recovery, where the behavior that was on extinction suddenly comes back for no apparent reason. But we know it to be because that's what happens with behavior that's been extinct. Extinction burst. The extinction burst is prior to the sudden reemergence. And escape. We don't know the function, right? We're not sure what the function is. We just know the behavior was on extinction. It went extinct. And then suddenly it came back. We would consider that spontaneous recovery. Lisa is hired by a school district to write behavior plans for several students. The district tells Lisa that she should only focus on problem behavior, but Lisa has identified skill acquisition opportunities as well. What is Lisa's obligation ethically in this scenario relative to the third-party contract? Third-party contracts can be tricky because we are being paid by individuals who may not be behavior analysts, who may not adhere to our same ethics, our same tasks, but as behavior analysts, we need to work and do what's best for our learners and clients. So Lisa, right, we're looking for her ethical obligation. Well, what's the scenario? She goes to a district to write behavior plans. They said, focus on problem behavior. Lisa, though, identifies skill acquisition opportunities as well. In this case, what is Lisa's obligation to the client and the school if she's in a third-party contract? A, strictly adhere to the district's policies at all times. Well, those district policies may not reflect what we are supposed to be doing as analysts. So you want to be very careful about this idea that no matter what, we're going to adhere to district policies because they may not be at all consistent with what we believe as analysts. B, inform the district of the potential skill acquisition targets. Yes, even though they've told her to do one thing, it is Lisa's obligation as an analyst to let them know and inform them of what she has discovered during the assessment. If there's targets, 
that are potentially targetable, Lisa needs to voice that. That doesn't mean they're going to let her, but she has to be forthcoming. C, provide services only as direct by the district. Again, yes, we're contracted by the district. Lisa is still the analyst. She's still the professional. She still has to do what she thinks is best for the client. D, discontinue services if she is not allowed to target skills. Well, that may not be the answer either, right? Just because she can't target those skills doesn't mean she can't write the behavior plans because even if she says, I have all these skills I want to target, if the school district says, well, that's not what we hired you for, that's okay. At least Lisa did her due diligence, gave the school an indication of what she knew, and then proceeded with what they hired her to do which was focused on problem behavior. But if Lisa wants to be ethical, she has to inform the district of potential skill acquisition targets. Analyze the graph data. What possible confound would you think is most likely given this experimental design? I'm kind of a tricky question, right? We've got a visual analysis question. Question wants to know what is the confound you think is likely? And confounds have to do with variables that can come into play that are going to affect the functional relationship between our intervention and outcomes. Let's first, with any visual analysis, what is the graph showing us, right? We have school days, so that is our time. We have number of eye pokes, so we're tracking the number of eye pokes per hour. We start with the baseline, this is A. We go to music, video game, back to music, back to video game, Back to baseline. So some sort of A, B, C, B, C, A, A, B, C, B, C, A, reversal design. Okay, so it's a reversal design. Now, what does it say? It shows baseline. From baseline to music, eye pokes decreased. From music to video games, eye pokes continue to decrease. Music, eye pokes increased some. Video back, baseline, another increased. And we go straight to video. And so it looks like the intervention was effective for music, and video games, potentially, right? More effective so for video games. So given that, what possible confound might we experience with this design? A lack of withdrawal could call into question functional relationships. Well, we did withdraw, right? Several times, actually. We have three baselines and multiple withdrawals. So A is not an issue. B, there's a high potential for observer drift. We can't really make that assumption from here. Data all look pretty consistent, pretty reliable. So observer drift does not seem to be an issue. We don't have enough information either way to make that determination. A sequence effect could impact this intervention. Could the order in which these items were introduced have an effect on the outcome? Sure. That's one of the issues with reversal designs, if we've got multiple interventions, is the order in which we're introducing these things and then moving to baseline, the order of the conditions can have an effect on subsequent conditions. D, this type of design is highly resistant to confounds. Not necessarily. It's up to us to control for confounds as much as possible. So a sequence effect could possibly impact this intervention. A company conducts a training program to improve employee speed in completing a new data entry task. During the first trial, employees complete the task slowly as they are unfamiliar with the system. However, by the fifth trial, their speed has significantly increased, regardless of changes to the system or conditions, simply due to repeated exposure to the task. What is the most likely explanation for the improvement in performance? So we have to analyze this question, right? We have to explain why performance improved. And what do we know? We know this company has a training program to improve speed. At first, speed is slow, but because they're unfamiliar with the system, but by the fifth trial, speed has increased significantly, but not much else has, right? There's no real changes to the system or conditions. Just by the fifth trial, the speed due to repeated exposure has gone up. How can we explain the idea that just due to exposure, performance increases? What's well, going to be a, a practice effect? A practice effect just says the more you're exposed or the more you practice something, the better you might get at it. And so when we're teaching a skill, we've got to be aware that just sheer practice and just doing the skill could lead to improvement, regardless of the intervention. Carryover and order effects have to do with interventions 
impacting more the intervention that follows it. So if I have intervention A and then intervention B, well, intervention A can impact intervention B just simply by being first. Order effect could be the order of the conditions, right? The order the interventions are implemented or baseline is implemented. And then habituation is have to, has to do with respondent conditioning and reacting to stimuli, which of course is not what is occurring here. What's happening here is that exposure, that practice is potentially impacting the improvement in performance. The owner of a Planet Fitness gym wants to learn more about what machines are used and how often those machines are used. The owner is busy, so they can't continuously monitor these items, but every 10 minutes, the owner will observe each machine and record what he sees. What is the owner using? Pretty straightforward measurement question, right? We're looking at the owner and he's trying to figure out how often his machines are being used. Cannot continuously monitor, so we know it's discontinuous. Every 10 minutes, the owner observe, observes each machine. So our interval is 10 minutes, and at the end of each 10 minutes, the owner observes and records what he sees. What do we call it when we observe at the end of an interval? Is it A, event recording? Well, event recording has to do with frequency, and this is not a frequency count. B and C, partial and whole interval, we're not observing at the end of the interval, right? We're observing the whole interval, not every 10 minutes or every end of the interval. What the owner here is using would be momentary time sampling. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Be sure to subscribe. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.